Well, good morning, faith family and guests. It's so good to see your faces today. Why don't we stand as we set our hearts to proclaim the worth of our God. Psalm 145 says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. last Sunday, and we're going to celebrate it again today. Amen? Well, let's celebrate in this baptism today. Church, you can be seated. Man, amen. Amen. Um, we have David Scruggs. 
Come and be baptized this morning. Amen. So family, friends, you can make your way down. Come on down and celebrate this time. Um, it's an awesome time to be able to start worship off celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. This is the perfect picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And we have David Scruggs. And it's kind of cool to have David up in here. I mean, he's not in my ministry anymore, but um, he came to know the Lord in my ministry. And to see him be able to grow in that um, and then him feel that conviction of needing to be baptized, not just wanting to, but needing to fulfill that baptism, that profession of faith as he sits before his church family to let you guys know that Jesus has changed his life. David, I got a couple of questions for you. Is Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life? Will you follow him for the rest of your life? Ma'am, because of that testimony and willingness to follow Jesus and believe his baptism. I now baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bury the Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen, church. Would you stand, find somebody around you, tell them your name, introduce yourself, tell them you're glad to see them today.
my hateful man lives and reigns in resurrection and can never die again. Here is love for all the ages, radiant sun of heaven he stands, calling home his father's children. Holding forth his wounded hand. Isn't that good news? His hands extended, wounded for us. Sing the gospel over one another. Lift your voice. There is no greater truth than this. You sing this. There is no stronger love Sing it again. There's no deeper peace.
Bless the Lord, my soul, all that's in us. Come on. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like me. given us life through his son. Come on. This is joy. This is true joy for us. Come on. Oh, blessed Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Let's sing
While you're standing, if you'll grab your Bible, we're going to be in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We took a little break during our Palm Sunday and Easter services, but we are going to return to our study of the book of Acts. And so if this is your first Sunday with us. We've been in Acts and we're going to pick up in chapter 19. I'm actually going to go back and get verses 8 through 10. And so those verses may not be on the screen immediately, but they'll catch up. And I'm going to read through verse 20, but we're going to cover through verse 41 today in our study. Hasn't it been great to sing truth that uh, death has not been found equal to the life of him who saves? And that death and hell call him victorious? And that there is one true king. And man, just think, sing like never before. Oh, my soul. That we get to sing in the victory and the power of Christ. And that should never grow old to us. In Acts chapter 19, there's this power struggle going on. But I think that's not a good phrase. I think power encounter is a better struggle, a better phrase, power encounter, because there's never a struggle for God. Now, it may be a struggle for the demonic and the powers of darkness, but it is not a struggle for the one who reigns over all things. And you're going to see this incredible power encounter where God changes a pagan city trapped in darkness. And guess what he uses? The gospel. What's your strategy for changing a city? The gospel. Well, what's plan B? There is no plan B because there doesn't need to be a plan B. His light shines in the darkness. And friends, the dungeon is set free all because of the truth of what he's done for us in Christ. And you're going to see a pagan city transformed by the power of Christ. How many of you think it would be great to see that in Decula? Yeah, I would say do it, do it again, Lord. Here's what it says. Luke wrote this in the power of the Holy Spirit, beginning in verse 8. He says that Paul entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, who are you jabronis? And the man in whom was the evil spirit (laughs) leaped on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. What a sight. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Father, would you allow your word to increase and prevail mightily in our hearts and minds, in our lives, in our faith family, in our city and in our county, in our state, in our nation, and across the globe today, Father. Faith families have gathered all across the globe. Pray, Father, your presence has been evident there, your peace for those that still remain for the rest of this day who will gather. May you show yourself strong. Would you move in here today? Remind us of your great power. The power that causes light to flood a city trapped in darkness. Sets people free. This resurrection power of Christ. That's not for just one weekend of the year, but every day that you grant to us. 
and there is no equal to you. And so, Father, would you use your spirit and your word just like you did at Ephesus? And as you use it, I pray that we too would come confessing our practices, having come under conviction of things that aren't worthy of Christ, that we too would put away things that represent our former life, that aren't true of us today, aren't helpful for us, and that you may be glorified. And we know that as the gospel advances, there will be opposition. But we know, Father, you have plans that you're working out. And those plans ultimately involve bringing us all the way home to you. May we be willing to face whatever opposition in full faith and confidence that you work out your plans while we remain faithful. So help us. I pray now that as we dive into your word, you would not just inform us of what happened 2,000 years ago in Ephesus, but what you're doing through your spirit, your word, and your church all over the world today and in this room right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I was uh, reminded, uh, we've, we've sung before, but uh, the little chorus when I was probably in middle school our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Let's do it again. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. God is an awesome God. And this is what I want our hearts to, to be stirred, to really affirm that God is an awesome God. Really the word awesome, God is the only one with whom it should be used. That he is in a category all of his own. And that even today he reigns. He's not wringing his hands and worry for it. He, he reigns. And as he reigns, he does so in wisdom, which means he reigns always for our best. He does so in power, meaning he will accomplish his full plans. And he does so in love. And that should be one that moves us and grateful that this king of all kings cares and has regard for us and has demonstrated his love. The church is in trouble when we lose sight of God's awesomeness, when we are no longer uh, in awe of who God is and what he has done for us in Jesus, and that he does reign and will always reign, and he does so with wisdom and power and love. As we pick up in our study of Ephesus, there is this power encounter. Ephesus is a very dark city. And um, we think about what we have seen of God's power displayed through his word. I, I shared even last week with you, and, and before we've shared, you know, Mark, when he puts his gospel together, puts those four stories together of, of the storm and of the demoniac and of the bleeding woman and of the dead little girl. And what he does in each of those is meant to show you the futility of those who are in the story. The, the disciples who were fishermen could do nothing Nothing to save the boat themselves or stop the storm themselves. The demoniac had been chained, but no chain could hold him. The woman who was bleeding had used all her money and there was no medicinal cure that could be there. And the little girl was dead. And all of this was to show how Christ was the hope in each of these. As he calmed the storm, as he drove out the demons, as he stopped the bleeding of the woman, and as he raised the little girl, all of it was the point that there is a power walking among them that isn't like anything else or anyone else and that this power was available and that God was doing something and it was a testimony to him did you know what not one time in the bible does satan ever overpower god did you know that Think about when the prophets of Baal, over 400 of them are gathered on Mount Carmel and they do everything they can to try to get a God that doesn't exist to do something. And then you just have Elijah and Elijah prays and says, God, show them. And fire comes down from heaven and consumes that whole altar that's drenched in water to show this incredible power of God. Friends, in our world, there's this picture of yin and yang, right? And these equals, God has no equal. The darkness is not equal to God. God reigns over all of these. But sometimes 
the darkness certainly can be powerful. There's no doubt about that. I remember when I was a little boy, my sister called. My sister went to Louisiana College, which is a Baptist college, the only Baptist college in Louisiana. LSU is the only Christian college in Louisiana. But my sister went to Louisiana College, and I remember when she called because uh, this Baptist pastor's daughter, that was a friend of my sister's, had conjured up this green sheen that danced around the room with her. The demonic is real, and I can remember my sister's concern and panic as she called my mom of what she'd experienced. Uh, I once wrote a paper in seminary called Dealing with the Demonic in Counseling because we actually didn't have a, a course on spiritual warfare at seminary, and so I wanted to be equipped. And it came in handy one day. I was ministering in a place, and I was staying next to the church. They had a house, and, and uh, it was sort of a hangout house for students and, and those sorts of things. And the youth minister and I were there together. And there was a knock on the door and I went to answer the door and this young college lady is standing there and she said, sometimes demons tell me to hurt people. And I said, what are they telling you now? <laughs> Cause I could not hear what was in her head. And then she said, look, you see one on that building? And I turned and I yelled for the youth minister. I said, hey, somebody's here to see you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was an interesting day. All of this uh, to, to create this picture that we go the other extreme and sometimes even in Christian churches, man, you get people who plead the blood of Jesus over everything. They bind Satan over everything. And friends, spiritual warfare isn't limited to the demonic. Our flesh is just as corrupt, right? But we sometimes get in this phrase of, well, we heard someone say this phrase once. Well, ask the sons of Sceva how that worked out for them that we encounter but aren't really equipped and, and sometimes we just choose to ignore. What I love is that God showed himself so strong in Ephesus that darkness was flooded with light and it had an impact on the economy of the idol makers in that town. Ephesus was being changed because the church was being changed. Ephesus was being transformed because the church was being transformed by the gospel. Could you imagine God moving in such a powerful way in Las Vegas that all the casinos closed down? Could you imagine God moving in such a powerful way that all the brothels shut down? Do you know how I know that revival hasn't occurred in Starkville, Mississippi? There's many reasons, but... On my way to start, well, every time I drove to preach at the BSU there or now to visit Arabella, there is what's called a gentleman's club on the main highway. You should know there are no gentlemen that are at that club. And every time I pass it, I pray for that club to shut down. Because what the ones who go there and the ones who work there are truly looking for will never be found there. But here's how I know that revival hasn't hit Starkville because that club's still open. When revival hits a true church and a true town, darkness loses profit. It changes the area where it is. And I would love to see Decula changed by the gospel because Hebron and every other gospel center church is not getting over the gospel, but growing in the gospel. And the power of God is moving among us. If we were to put this passage in a sentence, it would just be this, as we strive to faithfully proclaim God's word, may he change both our church and our city. I would invite you to pray that every day for us. That as we strive to faithfully proclaim God's word, may he change both our church and our city. And I've put our, our teaching points here as prayer requests. And here's the first one. Father, please change our church and our city by causing your word to be proclaimed consistently and to prevail mightily. Paul comes to Ephesus and what he does in verses 8, 9, and 10, we saw three weeks ago, but just want to remind you, 
He comes to Ephesus and he enters the synagogue because that's his pattern. He starts with people who would have a knowledge of scripture and he begins to teach. He actually got to teach in that synagogue longer than any other. He taught for three months in that synagogue and he's speaking boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn and continued in unbelief and they began to speak evil the way. So he withdraws from them and he goes not very far. He goes next door to this hall of Tyrannus. And from 11 in the morning until four in the afternoon, Paul would teach. We know that just from some extra biblical references that Paul would teach. So he would make tents in the early morning. He would teach from 11 to four and then he'd go back to making tents. They would shut down. How many of you think it would be great if we shut down from 11 to four every day still? They would take naps. Paul would then take that opportunity to teach anyone who would come. And it says he did this for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. You know what I love about last, uh, the, the, the Passion Week? I love when we get to gather together every day. I love when we have Palm Sunday and then we have a Passion Week teaching on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then we gather for our Good Friday service. I love it. I love getting to see you, see folks who come to hear, to sing together. Imagine this is what Paul did six days a week for two years. They're just gathering in the word. He's giving them the word. Certainly he's giving them the gospel, but not each day would have been just a simple gospel presentation. Matter of fact, we probably know what he would give him. In Ephesians, he writes a letter to the church at Ephesus, right? And he says, look, in chapters one through three, here is the gospel. This is what God has done for you. This is what the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are doing for you. Then chapter four, he says, therefore, now walk in this. Walk in this power. Don't walk like you used to walk. Walk in light, walk in love, walk in wisdom. And walk in the strength of Christ. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But this is what he's doing. He's, he's giving them the word. And I love that. Because what is it that changes a church and changes a city? Friends, it's not tricks. It's not just entertainment. Paul just every day said, here's the word of the Lord. Here's the word of the Lord. And for two years, it went out so that it says that all the residents of Asia, that would be Asia Minor, that province there, heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. We believe this is when those seven churches of Asia started. This is where the church at Colossae started because folks were hearing, they were being changed, and they were taking the word. And it wasn't about come and hear Paul. He's such a great teacher. It was about, hey, come and hear about Christ. He's a great savior. And so they were being changed. And I want us to be encouraged because as I've told you, uh, Ephesus was a difficult place. Why, why does this matter? Because I'll, I feel like sometimes, you know, we're like, Lord, where could I go and it would be easy to serve you? Anyone ever been tempted to think that? Just me. Okay. I appreciate none of you raising your hands on that. Sometimes you're like, we, we long, right? And, and here's the reality. There is no easy place to serve the Lord. There's always gonna be opposition and difficulty. And we know that it was the case even at Ephesus. Paul will write to Corinth and in 1 Corinthians 16, nine, he says that a great door for effective work is open to me and there are many who oppose me. And so as he, he writes to Corinth about Ephesus, he says, hey, I'm hanging here because God has opened a door for opportunity. But there's also a whole bunch of people that oppose me. And the reason I want you to look at Ephesus is because Ephesus was a place of materialism. So they had the temple of, of, of uh, Diana, or as she hears, she is Artemis, right? Uh, as she's known, they have this temple, and it's one of the seven wonders of the world. But they would also come and they would, they would deposit. So it became a financial center that was there. It was an athletic center. It was a political center. And then it was a pagan, a very sexual center. And so as we see the gospel advancing, it should give us hope. Many of you look at a place perhaps like New Orleans or Las Vegas, and you say, well, at least we're not them. You're wrong if you don't think the darkness isn't as bad here as it is there. The darkness is bad everywhere. But we look at Ephesus and we say, you moved there, God, you can move here. The question is, how much do we want God to move in Tequila? How much is it even on your radar when you leave this room on a Sunday? 
when you go to your appointed places on Mondays and Tuesdays, how much of a burden is it to see God move and show himself strong? Here, he does it in Ephesus. He does it in this environment. The word is going forth so much so that what he says in verse 20, the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This is my great hope for you. I don't have any tricks up my sleeves. If God doesn't build his church with his word and us faithfully teaching that in our services, in our connect groups, in our Wednesday nights, in our D groups, we don't have anything else to offer you. But what I would say to you based on Ephesus, there's nothing else we need to offer you. God used his word. The word of the Lord increased, prevailed mightily. God was using his spirit and his word in the lives of people. Years ago when I was in seminary, uh, there was a ministry, and it still exists, uh, called the Desire Street Ministries. And one of the projects that was very difficult in New Orleans was called the Desire Street Projects. And a young man brought his wife and his family and they moved into the Desire Street Projects. And they moved in with the word of the Lord. And they began to minister and minister so that God began to use them in that place and to see Desire Street Ministries progress to see the word spread in a very difficult part of a very difficult city. And what was the magic recipe? It was just holding forth the word of God in a dark place. It was being transformed. And here's where I would encourage you. Paul did this for two years. I feel it here. I've been here five and a half years. And we just keep holding forth the word. And you know what? we need to do we don't need to try something new we just need to keep giving the word and god will do his work if you're a connect group leader keep giving the word if you are a parent of a wayward child keep giving the word if you're a grandparent of a wayward child or grandchild keep giving the word keep texting the word if your spouse is wayward your friend is wayward keep giving the word this is what god used in ephesus and friends it's what he's going to use in tequila and gwinnett and all of our state that we continue to give the word and this is the prayer god keep help us keep giving it and would you increase your word and cause it to prevail mightily would you use your spirit to open eyes and ears to your word so that people may see you there's a second prayer request here. Father, please change our church and city by causing your power to be displayed so that Christ will be praised. So the word is going forth, and what God does is he supports that. He doesn't substitute it. He supports it by showing his power. Luke says God was doing extraordinary miracles. We already know that miracles are extraordinary, so these were extra, extra ordinary miracles that God was doing something, and don't miss that. God was doing it. It wasn't Paul. Paul's idea. It wasn't Paul's strategy. Paul wasn't the one who's like, hey, God, here, here's how I think people would receive it better. What about it? God was doing something and initiating it? And this is what was happening. It says, so that even the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. There's two ways that God is going to show his power to support his work going on. It's, his power is going to be displayed over diseases and his power is going to be displayed over demons. And, and you've got these handkerchiefs. So this would be more like sweatbands. All right. See if you can get a Lifeway promo. Yeah. And, and they would be while he's working, while he's making his tent. So his apron and the sweatbands. And it doesn't even say that Paul was part of it. Paul wasn't like, that was a good day. Here you go, kid. Here's my sweatband, right? Hey, here you go, bro. Take this apron. You got someone sick? Take. It doesn't even say that Paul was doing that. We don't even know how they were getting hold of this, but God was the one that was orchestrating. And so that when those went and they touched, it's similar to what the bleeding woman, when she touched the hem of Jesus's garment, she was healed. There's a, a callback to that. There's a, a picture of that. What it is not is what you see in our day with all the jabronis that try to sell you holy hankies, all right? When you see that on TV, 
don't buy that hanky, okay? Don't buy whatever their magic oil is that they're trying to sell you. Their goal is not ministry, friends. Their goal is money, 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 right? There it is, him from the old church, all right? Their goal is to profit off of your foolishness. That's not what's happening in this text. God is doing something. And the problem is we are so great at trying to make the sign the substance. But the sign was meant to point to someone greater, which is ultimately what's gonna happen. Jesus is gonna be the one who's praised, not Paul, but Jesus is gonna be the one who's praised. And so that it was not meant to be a substitute of the word, but a support of the word so that people could say, hey, you know what? Artemis, this, this Diana, she hasn't done anything for us. But man, I know this guy that's been paralyzed his whole life. And this guy's walking now. I know this person whose son was possessed by demons and now he's free. There's some power there that's not at our temple. There's some power there that's unique. And he gives a picture then. It says that these demons are being carried out. It brings to mind an example. There were itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. These weren't people who were part of Jesus. They were just people who tried to find the magic code to, to get demons out of people. We don't even know that they, they were not believers. He's real clear in calling them Jewish extras. They were for hire. They would get your demons out. They just had to unlock the magic code, which was up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, select, start. That is from the great book of Contra. If you were a Nintendo warrior back in the day, everybody, Gen X and 40, here we are today. So they would unlock the magic code and they're like, hey, this dude's Jesus' name seems to be doing some stuff. And so these seven sons of Sceva decided, hey, we're just going to call you out in the name of Jesus. And that's when the demon spoke and said, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus. And I know Paul. I don't know who you dudes are. And then that bro went completely berserk. And he jumped on all these boys so much so that they ran out bloodied and naked. And there was an example, all right? I hope it put them out of business, but they clearly lost that day. All of that was to, as a means of God showing his power. It says in verse 17, the great fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. The name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Now listen, if we're gonna reach people for Christ, we can't be naive about spiritual warfare. There's no doubt about that. And fear is something that moves people. That's why folks sometimes go the fear of the unknown. They, they go to consult a palm reader or a medium, right? There are no answers there, I can tell you that. But there's this fear of the unknown. Here it was a greater fear that all of a sudden there was a recognition of, man, there is a power that is among us that is unlike any other power. And it caused Jesus' name to be praised. And so here's my hope. I hope that as we hold forth the word, God uses his power in such a way that Christ is praised. Does that mean that every person we know in our faith family is gonna be healed? No, it does not. Does that mean that God's always gonna move in a way that we wish that he would? No, but he's always gonna move in a way that is for our best. And when he does, there's one source of that and it's his and his alone so that he and he alone gets the praise. And so as we hold forth the word, God, show yourself strong. Move in Decula, move in Gwinnett, so that Christ is praised. To know this isn't something that is happening because Hebron is great. God is moving because he is great. Third prayer request is, Father, please change our church and our city by causing your people to put away sin and to treasure Christ. So as that word continued to advance, look at what happens. It says 18, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. 
And so there are two aspects of this, but ultimately these are folks who are believers, but now they're coming forward to say, hey, here's some things that we've been doing. One aspect of this, if it were the magic arts, is the idea was what was said in secret would hold power, but by sharing it, it nullified that power, that they're being open and honest so that the power of darkness would have no power in a sense. But the bigger deal is God's spirit is using his word to cause people to confess, to say, hey, here's what I've been doing at my house. Now, you know, that's got to be the spirit of the Lord, because how many of you came prepared to confess sin in your connect group today? How many of you woke up and you said, man, I cannot wait to tell them what I did at spring break. Man, I got to tell you, I was at a wedding last night C20 about to confess all they did, a bunch of dancing queens over there. There was dancing at a Baptist party. I might have seen Mitch dance. I thought about it because we were over here singing, dancing in your freedom. That was the first song, right? I didn't see a single Baptist dance in this room. Last night, last night, with the great hymnist Vanilla Ice, All of this to say, I don't know what's going to be confessed in our C20 group today, but I know this, God is the only one who would move us to actually be real and vulnerable with each other because we're secure in the gospel and we're willing to seek help from our brothers and sisters. And I beg you week after week, hey friend, Whatever hurt, habit, or hang up you brought into this room, you don't have to leave with it. This is a place where Christ sets people free. And one of the ways that happens is we bring stuff to light that we've carried at home. And the word was moving in such an incredible way that people on their own accord says, man, I just need y'all to know what I've been doing and I want to be free from that. On top of that, those that were part of their magic arts books brought them together and burned them in the sight of all. Now, now this is important uh, because, you know, back in the day, it was popular to burn some stuff. I'm still resenting some things toward my, where my dad, when he was a little boy, went to church because he burned a Mickey Mantle baseball card. And uh, I would have enjoyed having that. My kids could, could go to college for a semester, right? You're like, no, it's all idolatry. What I want you to see is this isn't Paul organizing a burning of playing cards and a burning of records. This is the spirit of God moving in the people to burn these things that had made them money and were worth monetary value in Ephesus. And instead of it being used, so giving it to someone else to continue that person's journey in darkness, and in trying, instead of trying to recover money that was wasted on it, they said, no, 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 there's only one thing we need to do with this, and that is to burn it. And it's an even bigger picture because sometimes they were given these, uh, these spells and amulets that were meant to be protection. But friends, when you have come under the protection of Christ, you don't need any other protection. And they're burning it and it says 50,000 pieces of silver. The, the other picture there is it was 50,000 days of work worth that was burned. And you know why? Because the spirit was moving in such a way they, pray, they prized Christ more than anything else. And you know what I would say? Lord, please move in that way. Please move in our midst so that we are putting away the things that pull us away, the things that are, that are representative of our old past. Move in such a way that, that we hold you precious. Uh, Donald Barnhouse was a preacher in the early 1900s. And he tells a story one day of he was walking and this leaf fell on him. And when he, he picked the leaf off of him, it, it crumbled and disintegrated. The thing was, it wasn't autumn and it wasn't winter. It was spring. And it wasn't windy. But as he looked up, all of these leaves were falling. These are leaves that had hung on through the autumn winds, the cold winter frost. 
and they were still there. But now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, they're falling off. And it occurred to him they were falling off because it was spring and the roots were receiving a power of life that was coming up through the trunk and extending to those branches and extending so that buds of life were coming out and they were pushing out what was dead. Friends, that's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell with us. There is a life that expels the things of death. What is it that you keep holding on to that isn't a single benefit for your walk with Christ? What is it that if we were to have a burn pile, which we are not this morning, but what would be on that and at your initiative of the Holy Spirit, not me forcing you, that there's stuff that you would give over to him because it's not helping you in Christ and you've been set freed by that. I, I do wanna say one word about the demonic. Friends, you shouldn't read the horoscope. You're never gonna find any help there. Students, you should not have a Ouija board. You, you want a lesson to learn from the sons of Sceva? Christ is more powerful, there's no doubt. But demons aren't meant to be trifled with and demons are real. And Ouija boards aren't just a game. And everyone who tries to discount the darkness, that's what they do. Ephesians 5, Paul says, there are gonna be people who affirm the darkness all along. Don't listen to people who affirm the darkness. But I gotta tell you, the darkness isn't just found in the horoscope and astrology. I don't know what my astrological number, I think I'm a candy corn. I think that's what my <laughs> astrological uh, marker is. And, uh, and folks that are in this, but I gotta tell you, worldliness is on Netflix and net, uh, worldliness is in Prime. And students, you know one of the reasons why we did a teaching on Wednesday nights a few weeks ago on music? It's because there's darkness all through that mess. And what we let enter our ears and eyes is gonna have an impact on us in one way or another. And so what I would plead Wherever you're giving darkness an inch, put that mess away. Put that mess away. Well, the word continues to express, spread, and it causes problems for people who are making money off of it, which gets us to our fourth request. Father, please change our church and our city by causing our love for Christ to put all idol makers out of business. Here's what happens in verse 23. It says, about their time, there was no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, the silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see in here, not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. And what happens is, as God's word is changing the church in Ephesus, it's changing what they do, and it's causing a detriment. The idol makers, and so Demetrius represented the silversmiths, so this temple of Artemis, uh, people would come and they would either buy idols from these and they would give at the temple or they would take them home and participate. And all of a sudden, as they were doing their monthly checks and balances, as they were running their reports, they realized, you know what? Our profits have been decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. And, and you see what his motivation here is. His motivation isn't that he's opposed to really the content of the gospel. The bro just likes having money in his wallet. You'd be surprised how many people money can be a big motivator for. And so he our, gets his little group together and he says, hey guys, uh, if we don't do something about this, we're all gonna be out of business. Oh, and also, uh, you know, Artemis is, uh, you know, she's being maligned here and our, our whole city, we're patriots and all, you know? And so they get together and here's what happens. Verse 28, when they heard this, they were enraged 
and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion. They rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, that's the political leaders there, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they'd come together. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Chet and Nathan and I have been talking about starting a podcast that would be sort of a Monday morning of, of things we didn't go into the sermon. I know it would surprise you that there are things we actually don't cover, uh, but we would go deeper into this. And this is one of those where I'd love to go deeper into it because friends, we live in a day where facts don't get in the way of a frenzy. And there's a mob mentality and there's a crowd. It doesn't just happen in, in, in the world. Friends, I've seen it happen in rooms of Baptists where the mob can be swayed if you say the right words, right? Right phrases, the right things. I love that one guy's over here yelling, Artemis, and this other guy's over here yelling, bean burritos. Paul said bean burritos were going away. Bring back Mexican pizzas at Taco Bell, right? And then a whole bunch of them are like, we don't even know why we're here, but we're here. Let's do it. And our students in particular, the world is going to be swayed easily by all kinds of mess. You and I need to know that for which we are willing to take a stand, why we stand, and you need to know Christ is worthy of every stand. So this whole crowd is yelling, this poor Jewish guy, Alexander, they try to put him forward. He's not here to help Paul. He just wants people to know, hey, we're not with that guy. They don't even want to hear it. And so look at what it says. When they recognized he was a Jew for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, could you just imagine it? I can't because I, I stood in this theater where Nathan jumped off of it. But I stood in this theater and, and for two hours, they just yelled, Great is Artemis. Great is Artemis. I know, and, and, and I'm, I'm boggled by that because, number one, Artemis had never heard them, seen them, or done a single thing for them. But for, they would yell until their voice was hoarse about a goddess that didn't even exist. Yet you and I, have an opportunity to gather in this room every Sunday and raise a hallelujah to the God who does exist and who saves. But here they are for two hours, just yelling. The clerk ultimately will quiet them down, an elected official. He just says, men of Ephesus, who is there that does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? So there's this meteorite that fell and they felt like it looked like Artemis. We don't know how it occurred. And somewhere along the way, I'm sure someone fashioned something uh, just, like when, just like when Aaron in, in Exodus was like, I don't know, we put the jewelry in and out popped a cow. Mm-hmm, that's how it happened. And so Artemis is a sacred stone. He says, look, everyone knows this. And if you're worried because they're saying, hey, uh, we don't serve, we shouldn't serve gods made by hands. This wasn't made by hands. This came from the sky. This came from the sky, all right? So seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, for you've brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the Christmen with him have a complaint against anyone Courts are open and there are pro councils. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly, for we really are in danger. He picks up on the word that Demetrius used back when he said, we are in danger of losing our trade. This town clerk says, here's the real danger. You're in danger of being charged with rioting today since there's no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. All, all of this uh, to say that he says, listen, if you, you've got something to say, the courts are open, Demetrius, you can go there. Or 
we'll have an assembly, we'll have our political gathering. You can bring your concerns there, but this isn't the way you should do that. And in all of this, I just want you to see God's preservation of his people. Paul was willing to go in and wanted to go in, and, and the other disciples were like, don't go in, not this one, Paul. And even the Asiarchs were like, no, no, not that. God didn't need Paul to go in. God was able to use a pagan elected leader to diffuse the crowd and to allow the word to continue to express, uh, expand and express in Ephesus. And so here was this picture of the crowd dispersing and going back. And I love that uh, as God used his word that these pagan businesses were losing their profits again because the church was continuing to be changed. Before we move to the Lord's Supper, there's, there's one more prayer request, and it's, it's the verses that I skipped here. Here's the fifth one. Father, please change our church and our world by causing your plans to be followed joyfully, generously, and sacrificially. In verse 21, it says, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Why I, I just come back to this is because this is where we're going to go in Acts. And Paul says, look, here are the plans. I need to go to Jerusalem. I want to go to Rome. He actually has sent Timothy and Erastus on to, to get the offering from the Macedonian churches in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 where Paul writes about that offering. He's going to go collect that and then bring that as a part of the encouragement in Jerusalem. All this to say that as the word spread there was a support and there was a joyful and sacrificial following of wherever you lead god this is where i'm going to go wherever you lead here's my life and i want to follow you i want you to turn to ephesians 5 and and as we get ready to head to the table i just want to read ephesians 5 and encourage us because my my burden in this text is Hebron has been here over 180 years. Ephesus was being transformed and the church had been born just two years. And there's no doubt that Hebron has had an impact on this area. And we know that we look back, there were times obviously when this room was filled and this campus was full. And sometimes we wonder, man, is, is God going to move again in that way? And maybe he will. But I know he won't if there's no evidence of his power in our lives. We're still holding on to things of the past, of our sin and our old life. We're still pursuing those things. The gospel advances clearest and best through those who are yielded to Christ's purposes. And I want to say that our hope is that change occurs in this room so that change will occur on Fence Road and Auburn Road and 316 and 124 so that change occurs out there. And as I studied this text, I was encouraged that here's what Paul does. He just goes into this pagan city and he holds forth the word. God uses that to change people and then calls us the gospel to advance. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering, and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who's sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible for anything that becomes visible is light therefore it says awake O sleeper arise from the dead christ will shine on you let let me show you what this text is if you'll look right here for one moment here's what paul says hey church at ephesus that's where he was that's where we've been don't walk as you used to walk don't participate in darkness do not partner in any way with the darkness and don't ever stop prophesying against the darkness because there are people who are still perishing in the darkness. So our job as the gospel changes us is we don't participate in the things we used to do and we don't help other people do what we used to do. And those two aren't enough. We have to go further and say, those things are wrong. And in hopes that as we hold forth the gospel in light, That passage where it says, awake, O sleeper, and rise, for Christ has shone on you. And he gives two reasons. He says, we do this now because, number one, we are children of love. That's what he says in the beginning of Ephesians 5. And then he says, number two, we are children of light. You were darkness. You aren't anymore. Why would he use love as a picture Well, because as you pursue sin and idolatry and sexual immorality, there's no true love that will ever be found in that darkness. You and I are different. We are now children of love, imitating God's love that we love in a different way and we love in a self-sacrificing way. And then we are children of light. We walk in a different way because we once weren't just in the darkness, we were darkness. And we've never forgotten as we celebrate at this table that he came to get us and shine the light upon us. His closing word to the church of Ephesians circles back to where we started this idea of spiritual warfare. In Ephesians 6 verse 10, he says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And so here's his picture. As you stand in a dark place, you do so in the strength of Christ. He's given you everything you can. And I want to say... One last word here, particularly as he talks about this belt of truth. The, the, the mob, you know, was, was being swayed away. Young people, students, listen. There's this phrase that you hear all the time. Hey, I want to speak my truth. I read an article the other day and this young person says, hey, I'm going to speak my truth, which means you can't go against it. <laughs> okay. Let me speak my truth. I am skinny. (laughs) Don't you go against it in the concourse in a minute. You can't do it. It's my truth, right? Students, this is truth. We don't get to determine what is truth. God declares what is truth. And in our dark pagan world, We buckle the belt of truth around us. And the truth is, we were in the worst state we could be in. And God loved us and came and got us. And so we celebrate that at this table today. And as we come to the table, I want us to have a time 
where we respond, which we will afterward to this text. As you come to this table, friends, there there has to be a moment that you have given your life to Christ. That's what was occurring in Ephesus. People were hearing the word and they were coming to Christ. And so before you come to this table, this table is for those who've already come to Christ. And if that's you today and you need to give your life to Christ, I would encourage you, don't come to the table, but in a moment when we have a time of response, come and meet with a minister who is available to you. But maybe before some of you come to the table, you have been holding on to those things of the past life. And the word was moving in such a way that the church was confessing sin to each other on their own. They were being moved by God moving in them. And I would encourage you, you know why we do this at least once a month? Because we need to begin every month having our hearts recalibrated to the goodness of what God has done for us in Christ. To say afresh, Christ is my life. Christ is my only hope for not wasting the month of April. Christ is my only hope in the battle against the flesh and the world and the devil. And so we have this here. And maybe before you come, you need to confess some things to him afresh. And guess what you'll find? Forgiveness and mercy. That's what you'll find. We come to this table and as we do so, This is the picture of the greatest power encounter ever. We who were in bondage to darkness have been set free because death could not be found equal to the life of him who saves. Death and hell call him victorious. And that's what we celebrate each time we come to this table. We get to participate because we have been made clean. We have been redeemed, we have been rescued. And so for those of you who have yielded your life to Christ, you are a believer, I'm gonna pray for us and then I'm gonna invite you to come to the table to get the elements and then we will come back and we'll walk through them together. And then we'll have a time to respond further to our text and close out our service. Father, we thank you for today. I long for Tequila to be changed because we are still being changed by the gospel. I don't long for us just to have meetings on Sundays and it doesn't mean anything the rest of the week. That is not what occurred at Ephesus. What occurred at Ephesus is your word went forth, your power was displayed, people were set free from darkness, so much so that the culture of the city was being changed. I long for that, Father, in Decula and in Gwinnett and in Georgia. I pray as we come to this table now, we would do so in the hope of the one who lived for us, died for us, and was raised for us, that we may participate in this true power. And so may we come joyfully, May we come in full hope of sinners who've been made clean. And may we profess once again, Christ is our life. Christ reigns and Christ will return. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to come to these tables and to grab the elements.
What was Paul teaching in the hall of Tyrannus for those two years? He was teaching them this. Remember you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Jesus, we're so grateful that we who were far off, who were separated from you, who had no hope, you came, you through your body abolished the hostility. Through your blood, we were cleansed. And so we today, as we start this first Sunday in April, we say afresh, thank you for your life. Thank you for your sacrifice. That through your life, through your death and through your resurrection, we have access through the spirit to the father because you are a great savior. It's in your name we pray. Amen. What else was Paul teaching in the hall of Tyrannus? He was teaching this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he's blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So, Father, again, we thank you that this was your plan to reconcile us. And I pray that we would do what the word says here. We would bless you, for you have blessed us in Christ. And in particular, that we have forgiveness. We have redemption through the blood of Christ. And so I pray that we would live in such a way, and in the hope of this, that we have not just received your grace, we have been lavished by your grace. You have poured it out on us and you continue to do so, that we may live in the hope to which you have called us. Thank you, Jesus, for yielding your blood. Thank you for yielding your life, that we might have life. It's in your name we pray, amen. So let me close with this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You wanna know what was going on in Ephesus? People who were dead had been made alive. People who were in the darkness had been brought into the light. And all of this because of God's grace. They then were his workmanship. And as they lived out that gospel hope, Ephesus began to be changed. May that be true in Decula this week. 
We'll have ministers who are here, and I want to invite you, if you've never yielded your life to Christ, that today would be the day that you do so. If you've been carrying burdens and struggles from your past and you want to lay those down, there are ministers here who will pray. And then I want to challenge all of you. There's still people who are in darkness and death today who need the light. Who do you need to share with this afternoon? Students, who do you need to share with on the Monday after spring break? Who needs the gospel? May Decula and Gwinnett not have to guess if we are his workmanship. May his power be evident as it works out through us each week. So Father, we pray. I pray for those that are here who've never yielded their life to Christ that today might be the day of salvation. And I pray that what you did in Acts 19, you would do here as we just continue to hold forth your word. You would cause your word to prevail mightily in our hearts and minds. And then Father, through us, we pray that we would be moved to confess with one another struggles, sin, that we would be moved to put away the things that have pulled us away from you. And that we would be moved, even if we have to experience persecution and opposition, we will not fear, for you will work out your plans as you will, and they will always be for our best. I just pray that we would not be a people who it doesn't seem are changed at all by the gospel. Tequila is never going to be changed just because people meet in a room on a Sunday morning. Tequila will be changed if we are a people who meet in a room on Sunday and the hope of the gospel doesn't stay in that room. We are people who are continuing to be changed by the gospel. Please, God, please make that the reality. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing, and ministers are here to pray with you this morning.
I'm gonna ask our ushers to come down now as we transition into a time of responding through giving. Um, and let me pray for us. Father, we love you. We thank you for this word that we've heard today. Uh, this incredible picture of what it looks like to hold out your gospel, your word, and people respond, not through magic tricks, not through eloquence, not through um, man-made inventions, but simply because your gospel is powerful. And so I pray that we will live in the power of the gospel, that we will speak in the power of the gospel, that we will love in the power of the gospel this week, Father, uh, out of this challenge from your word to just trust in the power of your word. And so we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Our ushers are gonna be passing out the plates uh, for our, our members. If, if you are a, a guest with us today, th first off, thank you so much for being here. Uh, there's a card in, in front of you. And I'm realizing as I'm saying this that I've already asked the ushers to start. And so you're gonna have to fill it out really fast, but you can put your name, put an email, put the, the quickest email you have. Don't put the one that from 1998, the Yahoo address that had like 84 letters in it. Just put the quick one. Uh, and if you have a prayer request, you can put that down. We'd love to get in touch with you this week and pray for you. And the ushers will, if you need a minute, they will, they can come back, I promise. They, uh, just tell them, come back to my row. Um, somebody else probably needs to give on your row that they need to pass the plate again anyway. Uh, hey, today we've got starting point after the service. If you're curious about our church's beliefs, about um, our, our structure, about becoming a member, if you're an adult and you are curious about what does it look like to be baptized at Hebron Church, we invite you to come to starting point. We're gonna meet in the chairs over here by the baptistry about five minutes after the conclusion of our service. And so I invite you to come down um, and be part of that. It'll, it'll last about an hour. So we'll be done in plenty of time if you have kids and our kids programs to pick them up. We've got several other events coming up in our adult ministries area. We've got Secret Church that our C20 is sponsoring, but it is for anybody who wants to come. We've got uh, Women of Wisdom. We've got uh, Cooking Across Cultures, all, all different types of things. If you're curious about adult ministry programming and events coming up, we're gonna have representatives from our adult ministries team out in the lobby. You can stop by and register for a number of events. And if you just have questions about the types of things that we do, feel free and stop by after the service today. They'll be out in the lobby. Um, on Wednesday nights for our adults, if your class ended, if your adult Wednesday night class ended, we're gonna start a four week series starting this Wednesday night on the life and thought of the apostle Paul. And so even and as we've been going through Acts, if you're curious to know more about Paul, uh, his missionary journeys, what, what he taught, uh, his theology, things like that, come join us in E102 starting this Wednesday night at 645 while our student ministries, while our kids ministries have programming going on. Uh, we would love to have you join us for the next four weeks for that. Next Sunday is the last Sunday that you can sign up for Taste of the Nations. This is a really cool thing. We started it last year. So most of y'all know we have a quarterly member meeting once a quarter on Sunday nights. Well, for our April meeting, we started what we call Taste of the Nations because God has blessed us with just an incredible diversity around, uh, around our church and church membership and people that are coming. And we wanna celebrate that diversity. And so Taste of the Nations is we are asking our, our people to uh, to sign up to bring a meal that represents maybe uh, if you grew up in a different state or if you grew up in a different country uh, to, to represent food from your culture where you grew up. And so this, I mean, this could be anywhere, even South Georgia has its own food culture. And so I, I, we're inviting you to sign up uh, this week to bring a dish for our Taste of the Nations coming up in April. And we'll have more information about that coming soon. And then we have another Super Serve Saturday, this Saturday, April 13th. Uh, we, we had our first one a few weeks ago. We've got another one coming up. This is an incredible chance to just minister to families from the Decula area. Many of them, we had hundreds of people that came to our la uh, from Decula that came to the last one because of baseball games. Many of them don't know the Lord. They don't have a church home. And so uh, you can sign up and to serve. We really need you to sign up today, to be honest. We have a, some spots still to fill. Uh, if you can grill, if you can paint faces, if you can pick up trash, if you can just say hello, then we want to invite you to be part of that. So we've got a lot of stuff going on around Hebron uh, here in the next month or two that you can be part of, or you can get involved and you can serve. And so we're asking, hey, find an area, find a spot, jump in and serve with us.
All right, that's the last of our announcements today. Uh, here's what I'm gonna ask for us in our closing prayer time as you gather, if you came with family or with friends or even just right where you're sitting. We have two mission groups that have uh, just returned to the church from Guatemala and for, from Vermont. We've been praying for them. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to pray for today, to pray for, for the, the work that they've done, for the results to continue in those areas and for our partnerships in those areas to produce gospel fruit, fruit over the coming weeks and months and years. And so gather together with family and friends or even just right where you sit and pray for the long-term results of our mission trips in Guatemala and Vermont. Father, we unite together in prayer. Uh, first off, we thank you for good trips. Uh, this last week, we thank you for the fruit um, of the gospel that has already uh, been produced. Father, I pray that that will continue. I pray for our partnerships in both of these places, that those will continue, that you will op open up new partnerships for us, uh, that we will care about our city, our state, our country and the nations. And so, Father, I pray that you will stir in our hearts for more of our people to go. I pray that you'll stir in our hearts to continue to pray for opportunities for the gospel to flourish. And so we thank you for these. I pray that we will never take them for granted. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together for our closing benediction. Let's say our verse together. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Father, advance your gospel in us and through us for the good of our neighbors and the nations and for your glory. Have a blessed Sunday.